back to our series on uh, Genesis 1 and Lessons from Space. Uh, this session we're going to talk about the meaning of reason and the, and the limits of reason. How do we think? What does it mean to say something is reasonable? We, we saw last, last uh, session that, that faith and, uh, and reason are compatible. And so that, what that means is that uh, mankind can come to faith the same way he comes to hold any other position as true uh, by an evaluation of the available evidence. So what we want to do now is look at the process by which that should be done. And we want to look at what it means to, to say something's reasonable. Uh, we're supposed to have a reasonable faith. What does that mean? So this was our conclusion from last session. Uh, the compatibility of faith and reason allows us to come to faith the same way we come to hold any position as true or reasonable on the basis of the available evidence. And we can do this in a logically valid manner. So let's look at what it means to be reasonable. And to do this, we need to look at very basic logic. And I want to apologize ahead of time. This is the most esoteric of all the discussions. So if you make it through this, uh, you'll be into the pretty pictures next session. But uh, we have to lay the foundation, and so what we're going to see here is the basis for both faith and science. They both depend on reason, logic. Logic is just the study of correct methods of reasoning. And it establishes the correct relationship between statements of fact, which we call propositions, uh, that must be either true or false. So think of it this way. You all know what English grammar is. It establishes the correct relationship between words and a sentence. Well, logic does much the same thing as far as reasoning goes. It establishes the correct relationship between statements of fact and a logical argument. So let me give you an example. And this is called a syllogism. It's one of the most basic types of logical argument. And it's a deductive argument, and deductive arguments, if they're done properly, establish what their, their conclusion absolutely. That hardly ever happens, but that's what deductive logic does. So this is symbolic, and we'll look at something, uh, a sentence in a minute, but if A is equal to B, and B is equal to C, what can we say about A and C? Somebody. They're equal, exactly. They're both equal to B, so they're equal to each other, right? So A is equal to C is our conclusion. So there are three propositions there, three statements of fact, two premises, and the premises are arranged such that they imply something about the third one, which we call the conclusion. And that's a logical argument. That's everybody with me so far. Very simple. So let's, uh, for those of you who don't like symbolic language, let's look at uh, a sentence. It's exactly the same relationship. All dogs are mammals. All mammals have lungs. So what can we say about dogs and lungs? All dogs have lungs. Very good. So we're moving right along here. Nobody's asleep yet. This is good. So now I'm going to throw you a curve. I'm going to change a word. <clears throat> All dogs are mammals. In the second premise, though, all mammals have wings. Just bear with me a minute. This is precisely the same relationship as we had in the previous argument. This is a, a logically valid argument. It has the right structure between the premises. If this were true, if you'd never seen a dog before and uh, you had these two premises, what would you conclude about dogs and wings? All dogs have wings. And now you see maybe the, the limitation of deductive logic. So if we concluded that, we would say all dogs have wings. This is a valid argument, has correct logical arrangement, but it's false, obviously. We all know that dogs don't have wings. We don't know that by logic, though. In fact, we could not know that strictly by deductive logic. How do we know that? Yeah. This is not really difficult, is it? <laughs> Experience. Okay. 
So I want to change one more word, and I'm going to make that second premise true. It was false. Our problem there was the second premise is false, and therefore the conclusion is false. But if we change one more word, some mammals have wings. That's a true statement, isn't it? Bats have wings. Pigs don't, right? Pigs don't fly, right? So, so now we have a true second premise. But you'll notice that it's a little different from the first premise. In the original argument, we had all dogs are mammals, all mammals have wings, and therefore all dog I mean all mammals have lungs, and therefore all dogs have lungs. All, all, all. Now we've got all dogs are mammals, some mammals have wings. This is called a particular uh, uh, premise, and it means some particular animals have wings, bats, and some don't. So <clears throat> what can we conclude from this strictly from logic? And the answer is nothing. We don't know from strictly from logic. If you'd never seen a dog, you wouldn't know which group to put dogs in, mammals with wings or mammals without wings. So the problem is our inability with, with uh, deductive logic is our inability to find absolutely, universally true premises. If we could do that, then we could know something absolutely and we wouldn't have to have faith or belief, we would just know it. But unfortunately, this kind of logic only takes place in a very limited number of cases, hardly ever in everyday life, mostly in the field of mathematics. So, a deductive logic proves what's absolutely true. It's, it's, it, uh, if it's done correctly, it's, its conclusion is absolute. It depends on a priori knowledge, in other words, our existing knowledge base. And so the problem is our knowledge base is never absolute and universal. Most of us don't have absolute knowledge bases. So pure deduction is very limited. And as I say, it's found only in the field, usually in, in mathematics, very limited number of cases, pure deductive logic. So how do we make decisions? Well, we use a form of logic called inductive logic. An inductive argument doesn't prove something absolutely, but it states what is probably true. Probably true. Maybe highly probable, but still not absolute. So let's look at some examples that use inductive logic, basically in everyday life. Virtually every decision you have ever made in your whole life, and some of us are old enough to have made a lot more than others, was made on the basis of inductive logic, if it was made on the basis of, uh, if it was made rationally. You don't have to make a rational decision, but if you do, this is the type of logic you use. If you're going to uh, buy a suit of clothes, you look at... Uh, in your closet and you see what color suit you need and you go down and you, you measure your height and, and your girth and, and you pick out a suit. If you're going to buy a car for your family, you know, you might first count heads and make sure you have enough seats in the car and then uh, you decide uh, if you want to buy one for economy or one that's going to go from zero to a hundred in six seconds. Uh, and you make all these decisions and then your wife decides what color you're going to get. This is an inductive process. What about when you get married? You know, when you decide to get married, I didn't go down to my friend George, the mathematician, and say, George, I want you to derive an equation, and the solution to this equation will tell me, <clears throat> out of all the women in the world, which one is the right one for me to marry. It just doesn't work that way, does it? How do you decide who you're going to marry? You get to know them, don't you? You find out things you like and things you don't like. And then you, uh, you, you kind of weigh the evidence. And, you know, now not everybody does this, obviously, but they should. This is an inductive process. Let's look at other places. How about in the court of law? In our country, in the court of law, it's not required to prove a man's absolute guilt. If it was, we would never put a criminal in jail. Never. What is required? Proof beyond any reasonable doubt. 
It's an inductive process. The bad news is, even that's not used a lot of times. Uh, just this is a side, but I have a friend that was a lawyer, and we were having an argument one day, and I finally said, uh, David, did you ever take logic in school? He said, no, it wasn't required. And I was blown away. I thought, you know, surely you would use logic in a court of law. So I asked another friend of mine who's a retired judge, and he said, said no, it, it wasn't required. It wasn't part of the curriculum. said, I, I took it on my own, but uh, it wasn't required. He said, you don't understand. The object is not to find truth, but is to get the jury to agree with you. So I said, so you uh, majored in psychology? He said, yeah, that's more helpful. But if things are done, if, if you try to find truth in a court of law, it's an inductive process. There is no absolute guilt or innocence. How about science? This might surprise you. But science, although it's very organized and, uh, and thorough and, and, and fastidious in the procedures it goes through, science is an inductive, logical process. Science does not absolutely prove its conclusions. There are a lot of examples of this. In, uh, in the 1600s, Sir Isaac Newton uh, discovered the, the laws of gravity and the, and the three laws of motion. And for over 300 years, that was it. That's why they were called laws. Everybody thought that was it. At the beginning of the 19th century, there was one famous scientist that bemoaned the fact that there was nothing else to discover. And within his lifetime, we'd, we came up with uh, quantum mechanics, and, and Einstein developed his uh, theory of relativity. And it changed the whole way we look at nature. Sir Isaac Newton's laws were found to be not incorrect. They're, they're, they're very good for everyday life. But if you go to the very small or the very fast, then they don't hold any longer. You have to make corrections. That's what Einstein found out. So science is not absolute. It's all the time having to be corrected. It's our best current understanding of how things work, how nature works. So let's look at the logical basis for science and what science is. First of all, science is not a world view. You know what I mean by a world view? the colored glasses that you look through, everything, to, 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 the way you interpret everything you see. Uh, I have a, a Christian worldview. Um, others have an atheistic worldview. They see things differently than I do. Some people have a materialistic worldview, and we'll talk about that later, but I don't want to get onto it right now. But, but <clears throat> worldview is the way you see the world. Science is not a worldview. It's a tool with which to understand the world. It's perhaps the greatest of all human achievements. Science is, has its place. Science should be an objective, rational, and very systematic search for an understanding of the workings of nature. In other words, how the material universe works. And therefore, it's limited to what can be observed, seen, felt, taste, uh, heard, etc., and what can rationally be extrapolated from our sensory observations. It's unable to go beyond that. Science, as I said, is an inductive process. It does not absolutely prove its conclusions, and it should never be considered absolute. And you won't hear that much today. We, we have, I think, uh, it's a great thing, science. But we have too much respect for it sometimes today. As such, science has limitations. It cannot address questions of why. Why are we here? It can't. It, it can't tell you logical motivation for something. It cannot address non-physical phenomenon, such as the, the mind, or values, or decisions. What is the, uh, the color or the temperature of a decision? See, that's, that's a nonsense question, isn't it? 
Because a decision is not physical, is it? And yet, physical decisions have real physical consequences. If you're smoking a cigarette and you carelessly throw the butt out of the window and it lands in a pile of leaves along the side of the highway, it can burn down a forest. If you make a bad decision, it can ruin the rest of your life. Decisions have real physical consequences, but they are not physical. And science cannot say anything about decisions. Science does not address single event phenomena very well. Think about uh, miracles and, and the beginning of everything. You can't take the beginning into a lab and do it over and over and over and study it. It happened long ago. Nobody was there to observe it. And it's very difficult for us to say much about it from science. More about that later. Science is based on cause and effect relationships. Uh, one of the basis of science, and we'll look at this later, is, is that for every event there has to be a cause. Cause and effect relationship. So scientific experiments are designed to determine cause and effect relationships. Scientific theories are models, in other words, mathematical representations of cause and effect relationships. It's all about what happens and what caused it. Let's talk about materialism for a moment. I mentioned it a while ago. Materialism is a worldview. And a materialist believes that the only thing that's real is the material universe and its laws. Everything else is imagined or an illusion. So think about that. It's a philosophical worldview. And it has some drastic consequences. Unfortunately, it is a worldview that many scientists have. And yet there are things about it that are absolutely inexplicable, like the decision. There are other things. It, 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 out, out, well, it, it rules out God, obviously. But what about love? I could ask the same question I did a while ago. What's the color and temperature of love? There are things that we all believe are real that this worldview would declare a figment of your imagination. Um, material, materialistic science is the subjugation of science to materialistic philosophy. So if, if you're a scientist and you're a materialist, then you're going to say that any explanation must use only things out of the material universe. Nothing that can't be felt, seen, tasted, touched, whatever, can be used as an explanation. That's materialistic science. And you can see that it puts limits on what science can do in, in our search for truth. Here's a quote from Francis Crick. He's one of the two discoverers of, of DNA. The astonishing hypothesis is that you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, and your sense of personal identity and your free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and associated molecules. That's bleak. What is life if that's your, your worldview? It rules out the self, the mind, feelings, beliefs, love, decisions, values. You see, value, that's not a physical thing, but we all place values on things. Morality and God are all just illusions or imagination. By the way, not all scientists are materialists. There was a study done by two professors at Georgia Tech several years ago, and the split is roughly 50-50. You would, listening to news, you would think that 99% uh, that of scientists are materialists. Uh, everywhere you look, you see the assumption of materialism. If you look at uh, the, uh, the local paper, the nightly news, 
National Geographic. Any of these things, you'll see articles, and the basic assumption is that everything has to be explained by a material cause. From the biblical perspective, science and revelation are logically inseparable. And if we look at, at the Bible, uh, it says God is the creator of all things, Genesis 1.1. It says Jesus is that aspect of God through which creation was carried out, First uh, John, John chapter 1. Nature uh, reveals the divine power and nature of God, says Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Moreover, uh, science relies on a rational universe. We cannot have science if the universe is not repeatable and rational. Back when I was working for NASA, if I went into my lab on Monday and I did an experiment and I got a result, and I went into my lab on Tuesday and I did that identical experiment again under the identical conditions and I got a completely different result. And I go over to, to Atlanta, Georgia, and I do it in a lab over there, and I get a third result. What am I going to conclude? You see, science will not work without repeatability and rationality. And so science requires a rational universe. Uh, Thomas Nagel is a professor at New York University. He's a, he's a philosopher. And uh, he was at one time one of the pillars of Darwinian evolution. But look what he says about this. Science is driven by the assumption that the world is intelligible. Without that assumption, the intelligible underlying order, the discoveries of the scientific revolution, the 16, 17, 1800s, could never have been made because of what I just explained. He goes on to say the intelligibility of the world is no accident. Nature is such as to give rise to conscious beings and minds and as such as to be comprehended to comprehensible to such minds. That's true. It's interesting uh, how he tries to explain that in his book Mind and Cosmos. We would explain it. It's interesting, I think, that a young physics student can sit at a desk and solve some equations and tell us where Mars is going to be next month. And you ask the question, okay, why is there a relationship between what's going on in, in her mind and what's going on out here? And there's no answer unless you accept the fact that this intelligence was put here by the same intelligence that made that out there. They come from the same source. C.S. Lewis, you probably all know him, he's a well-known writer. He says, science owes its origin to Christianity. So not only are they compatible, but science owes its origin to Christianity. He says, men became scientific because they expected law in nature. And they expected law in nature because they believed in a law giver. It's interesting that the scientific revolution occurred in Christian Europe, beginning in the 1600s. Why didn't it occur in the Far East? China had a, 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 a high level of civilization when people in, in Europe were still hunting and gathering food. So why didn't the scientific revolution occur in China. Well, he goes on to say that because the scientists of the 1600s were virtually all Christian, they believed in a creator. And they believed the creator was intelligent. And so they believed that the creation would reflect his intelligence and it would be ordered. And since they believed in order, they looked for order and they found it. And the fact of that order has been proven over and over and over for the last 300 years or more. In laboratory experiments, all kinds of other things. The universe is ordered. You don't find that out if you are of an Eastern religion because they don't believe in a creator. 
And they don't believe in an intelligent creator. And they have no reason to go look for order. But because Europeans were Christian, they look for order. So science owes its origin to Christianity. Science is not the enemy of faith. Rather, it provides a window into the creation. And this is what great scientists of the, of the revolution, like Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Faraday, uh, Maxwell, and a, and a whole lot of others, who were Christian. And they believed that through their science, they had a window into how the Creator created. In fact, um, <clears throat> Johannes Kepler, who was the, uh, the first man to put mathematics to the fact that the planets go around the sun, uh, we still talk about Keplerian orbits because the mathematics describes where Mars is going to be next month. It describes where a, a satellite is going to be the day after tomorrow. Uh, the chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God. Paul says something simpler, sim similar. Uh, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. And I would remind you that he said this in the first century. What would he say to us today with our Hubble telescope and 50 years of space exploration and, and three or four hundred years of modern science and all that we've learned about his creation? Let's change gears a little bit and look at the limits of understanding. Uh, there are limits. There are limits to how, what we can reason. And I want you to think of a couple of things that you're all familiar with, like gravity. What is gravity? Anybody? What's that? That's what it does, but what is it? Don't worry about it. Nobody knows. Nobody. No, no scientist knows what gravity is. We just know what it does. We, we can calculate to a gnat's hair what speed we should go to escape Earth. We can, we can put a, a probe and have done it on one of the moons of Saturn after a four billion mile journey. But we don't know what it is. You know, and, and so I asked the question, uh, we all accept absolutely that the sun and its gravitational field hold our world in an orbit, a very precise orbit, by the way. We'll talk about how precise it is uh, uh, next week. But <clears throat> we all accept that, don't we? I mean, our, our Earth is not, not going out through space straight ahead. And that was one of uh, uh, Sir Isaac Newton's laws, that anything that's moving tends to keep moving in the same direction unless there's a force on it. So our, our, our Earth, if you're swinging around, you know, one of these little paddles you, you bounce the balls with and you're slinging around, what happens if that, uh, if that rubber band breaks? You don't want to be standing too close, do you? It shoots out linearly. That's what our world would do if it weren't for the gravity of the sun. So let me ask you how reasonable it is that the sun, through millions upon millions upon millions of miles of nothing, exerts a force on our earth that holds it in an orbit. Why do we think that's reasonable? And we think it's unreasonable that a man over in Galilee could walk on the lake. Is it because we understand gravity? So let me ask you, uh, gravity only attracts, right? We've never seen it repel. By the way, if, if we ask what it is, a little kid will say it's, it's the reason I fall down and skin my knee, right? 
A freshman in physics says it's a, a force that exists between all, all matter. And on earth, the earth is massive enough that if you drop something on earth, it accelerates toward the center of the earth at, at 32 feet per second for every second it falls. That's an answer. A professor of physics might say, well, it's, it's a long-range weak force that comes out of the derivation of the general laws of uh, general relativity. Three very different answers. Very different understandings of what gravity does. But none of the three tell us what it is. So, so we have this, this sun that holds our earth, and we all accept it. And yet, if we talked about somebody walking on the Gunnersville Lake out here, you would probably all go home right now. Why is that? Because since we were a little kid, gravity has made us fall down. It's always been observed to be an attractive force, without exception. So if you think we understand it, let me ask you, why is that? Not all forces are like that. How about a magnetic force? You know, a magnet has two poles, and if you put a north and a north together, they repel. But if you put a north and a south, they stick. A magnetic field is what we call bipolar. It has a north and a south pole. How about electrical forces? Positive and negative, same thing. They attract if they're, they're different, and if you put two positive charges, they repel. Gravity only attracts. It never does anything else. And nobody knows why. We don't understand it. Yet, you know, is anybody worried about it? You know, if, if, if there weren't gravity, like you said, we would fly off of the earth. It's what holds us on the surface. So is anybody worried when you step out of the building at night, you're going to go, Pew! you know? You don't worry about it. We accept it. But I would submit to you that we accept it on the basis of experience, not understanding. And this is an important thing to understand. Let's look at another one, the electron. You realize there's a, a, a valid scientific experiment you can do in which electrons look like little particles, like a whole bunch of BBs. They, they bounce off of each other. They exchange momentum. They, they change direction, you know. But there's another experiment you can do, equally valid, in which electrons behave exactly like the ripples on a pond when you drop a pebble into it, like waves. Now there's a difference in waves and BBs, right? So how can an electron be both? Well, science solved that problem. They call it a wave-particle duality. And so I'm supposed to feel good about that. I have a name for it. We don't understand it. You know, it would, it would appear that, that you can apply the, 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 the story about the three blind men around an elephant, and one has hold of its tail, and one has its arms around a leg, and the other one's got a trunk. And all three have real but very different ideas about what an elephant is. I think that's the case here. I think we are seeing certain aspects of an electron, but not the true basic electron. Someday maybe we'll see it. You, well, most of you probably know who Warner von Braun is. I, I'm surprised I have to explain this sometime. But he was a German scientist in World War II. Came to the United States after the war with his, his uh, team from Pinamundi. And around Werner von Braun and his team, NASA was formed. He was the director of Marshall Space Flight Center uh, when I came up here in the 60s. He's a brilliant man. Uh, if, if you met a man of that capability, uh, either in public relations or organizational skills or technical ability, in any one of those areas at his level would be kind of a once-in-a-lifetime thing. But look what he says. What strange rationale makes some physicists except the inconceivable electron is real while refusing to accept the reality of God on the ground they cannot conceive Him. Anybody here can conceive the electron as both a wave and a particle? But you don't hear, hear people questioning 
the reality of an electron, but you do hear them questioning the reality of God. Let's talk about the absence of the absolute. We humans are not really capable of absolute knowledge. There was a 17th century French philosopher, René Descartes. Uh, you may have run into him before, you may not realize it, but if you took uh, algebra, you uh, probably know about Cartesian coordinates, XY coordinates, developed by René Descartes. He wondered if there was anything that he could know with absolute certainty. Being a philosopher, he developed this philosophical test. Um, he called it uh, rational skepticism. And the idea is that if something can be questioned, then it can't be absolute. If it were absolute, you couldn't question it. So he began to list everything he thought he knew for certain. And if it could be questioned, he'd throw it out. and He'd think something else, throw it out. And he went through this long, arduous process. And he finally came up with one thing and one thing only that he thought he could know with absolute certainty. It was a great day in the field of philosophy, and they made a name for it. It's called the Cognito Ergo Sum. Now, you all know that. Maybe not by that name, but you've probably heard this. Isn't that pitiful? The only thing that he could figure out that he knew with absolute certainty. And I don't think anybody else has done much better than that. So it's interesting to me that that's the fact of our human condition. And yet, and, w and we can know nothing about anything in life with absolute certainty. And yet, we want to impose that requirement on God, on faith. Let's talk about the incomprehensible. Think about things like gravity, beginnings. We just talked about gravity. Beginnings. What was before the beginning? Before there was anything, the creation. What was it like? No space, no time, no matter, no energy, nothing. God. What would that be like? We can't comprehend. Infinity. Pick a big number, I'll add one to it. And we can do that all night. There is no infinite number. It's a concept that we struggle with. So there are a lot of things that we simply have to accept. And this is not only true in religion. Uh, religion is criticized because supposedly Christians just accept God. But it's also true in science. Every single day, scientists accept things like gravity things like the electron, and a whole host of other things. So what makes something reasonable? I would submit to you that the state of being reasonable depends far more on what we have experienced and become comfortable with than what we can actually logically prove. We accept all kinds of things that we cannot prove and we think they're reasonable. So here's the result of the way we are wired. That which is experienced sufficiently is declared to be normal and natural. What about the birth of a baby? Nobody gets excited about that anymore. It's happened a few times. But can anybody explain exactly what goes on there? That which cannot be experienced, on the other hand, is simply dismissed as unreal. So if we don't have any experience base, we get very, very skeptical. Now, maybe that's justifiable, but logically, that doesn't make sense. So, therefore, therefore, the problem of revelation. How do you reveal something like the supernatural? Well, the evidence for the supernatural must be supernatural. 
If it weren't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't show that the supernatural exists. So you have to have something supernatural to occur to show that there is a supernatural. And by that I mean supernatural. It's inexplicable within the material universe and its laws. We cannot explain it. Uh, it must be clear and unambiguous. It must be observable. If it's not observable, what difference does it make? It must be well documented uh, because it can't be repeated every day. If it were, it would be like a childbirth. We would accept it as real, as, as natural. So we're kind of in this, this box here. We, we demand evidence, but if we get too much evidence, then it's no longer supernatural. It's natural, and we expect it to happen. So, so evidence of the supernatural must be essentially non-repeatable, like a resurrection. If every, every Monday morning, every, every first Monday, on Scottsboro Courthouse Square, they resurrected somebody, it wouldn't be too many years before we would come to accept that and expect it. That's the way we're wired. So God cannot give us constantly evidence of His existence. He can't do miracles every day for us or there wouldn't be miracles. You see, we don't understand a lot of the things that are around us. We don't understand this universe. We don't know how it got here. We'll talk about that more. We understand a lot about it, but there are things we don't know that we accept. So I want to tell you a little story. It was written by Edwin Abbott in the 1800s. He was a, a schoolmaster and a mathematician in England. And this little story, I think, will help us understand, uh, make, make some plausibility arguments about some things that would seem uh, a real stretch for us normally. The name of the book is Flatland, and it's called Flatland because it's about a, a, a race of beings that live in a two-dimensional universe. It's flat, like the top of a table. There's width and depth, but no height. There's no third dimension in Flatland. You have north, south, east, and west, but no up or down. Now, we live in a three-dimensional universe. We have width, depth, and height. They only have width and depth. And that means everything is in the plane of flatland. The, the, the beings that we're talking about are geometric shapes. And your intelligence and your status in, in, in society depends on the number of sides of your figure. So you have a triangle, that's the working class. Uh, professional class, professors, lawyers, doctors, or squares, pentagons, and other higher order polygons. At the pinnacle of society and intelligence are the wise priests. They are circles, supposedly with an infinite number of sides. And my wife, slammed the book shut at this point and said, I don't have to read this. This is written in 1800, right in England. Women didn't have suffrage yet, and uh, they weren't allowed to go to college at that time. So a woman is a straight line here. So, flatland. The, the beings of flatland are free to move around on the surface of their, their universe. They live in five-sided houses, and they have these shapes. Now, there's a problem. You see, if you meet the high priest on the street or you meet your local butcher from the grocery store, you need to know which it is. How do they know it? Well, you say, no problem. I can, I can see a triangle, a pentagon, a square, a circle. No, no problem. But you see, you're looking down on that. A being in flatland can't look down on these shapes. So it's, think of it like this. If you put a quarter on the table and you look down on it, it's a circle, right? But as you move your eye toward the plane of the table, it becomes an ellipse and a line. And all figures in flatland do that. So now who's who? So the ones, the flatlanders who've had plane geometry realize there's a relationship between the number of sides and the angle of any corner. 
An isosceles triangle has a 60 degree angle, a square has a 90, uh, a pentagon 108, and so forth. So, so those who've had plane geometry can go up and, and feel a, a, si a corner of their acquaintance, and they're calibrated, and they can tell exactly if they're talking to, to, the, uh, to the butcher, or to the priest, or to a doctor. Um, unfortunately, those who haven't had plane geometry have to simply walk around and count sides until they get back where they started. So, another problem in flatland. All the beings of flatland are what are called um, uh, 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 normal. They, they have all the sides are the same length, except for soldiers and policemen. They're what we call a isosceles triangle. They have a very short base, and that makes their figure sharp. And that's what makes them lethal, is that point on their, their upper end. But think about the women. They're just a line. They're like a needle. In fact, if they're facing you, you can't even see them. They're just a point. And so many husbands met their demise because they didn't see their wife and impale themselves on them. Think about the carnage on the streets when everybody's out shopping and women are going up and down the sidewalk. And if they're directly pointed at you, you can't see them. And they're deadly. So they passed two laws to protect the men in, in flatland, the males. And uh, first of all, a woman, when in public, must first of all make her presence known by the continual drone of her peace noise. In other words, she must talk incessantly. And secondly, in order to be seen, she must sway to and fro as she walks to be periodically visible to all of those in her path. So here's a woman in flatland. Okay, so you understand why my wife didn't read this book. Let's talk about some incredible things that occur in, in Scripture, and maybe this little story will help us understand them a little differently. In Samuel, we read about the disembodied voice that spoke to the young Samuel one night. Three times he went in and woke up Eli, the high priest, and said, What do you want? And Eli said, I didn't call you. And finally, Eli it dawned on him, he says, it's the Lord. So Samuel went out and, and, and God told him about what's going to happen to Eli. A disembodied voice. Uh, Saul of Tarsus, on his way to Damascus, was spoken to out of a blinding light. How did these happen? In Hebrews, we're told that God sees all things. Nothing is hidden from His sight. We live on a globe, on a, on a sphere. There are people on both sides, and it's opaque. How do you see everybody on, this, on the earth? Not only that, I used to be a spelunker when I was younger. Go in caves, explore caves, under the ground. There are miners that work way underground. How's God going to see all that? You have the, uh, the sudden apparition of, of Christ in the upper room which the apostles had carefully locked because they were afraid of the Jews and the Romans. And suddenly he appeared among them. How did he do that? How can we view such things as rational or plausible? Well, I think this little story will help us. Uh, the story is told by a square who is a mathematician. And really, what would mathematicians be other than a square? That's... Uh, Back in my day, square was the same thing as a nerd. So he was at home one night. His wife is asleep. His two grandsons, little, little pentagons, are fast asleep. And he's up by himself, and he's studying plane geometry when he hears a voice. And he looks around, and he doesn't see anything. But this voice keeps talking to him. He thinks, well, maybe my wife's up, and she came into the room, and she's pointed at me, and I can't see her. So he, he looks around. He doesn't see her. He goes and checks, and she's in her bed. He checks his grandsons. They're in their compartments. And he comes back, and this voice keeps talking. And it's trying to tell him about some cockamamie idea of a third dimension, which nobody in Flantland has ever, ever observed, ever imagined, ever even thought about. Now, being in a three-dimensional world, we can understand what's happening. The square is being visited by a sphere from Spaceland, the universe of three dimensions, like ours. The sphere, because it's in three dimensions, is not confined to the laws of flatland. 
and it can exist above the plane of flatland. So he's hovering just above the, the, the square's house, very near, but out of his universe. And he's talking to him, and the square can't see him. So they talk and they talk and they talk, and the square just cannot understand this idea of a third dimension. It's, it's as if I told you there was a fourth spatial dimension, okay? And we have three dimensions. We have depth, width, and height. And if I point there, it's height, there it's depth, there it's width, but over here is a combination of those three. In fact, I, can, I cannot point anywhere that's not a combination of those three dimensions. So in flatland, it's the same way. They don't have the third dimension, but, but you can point anywhere in the plane, and it's a combination of those two dimensions of the plane. But the sphere is not confined to that, and so it can exist out of the plane, out of the view of the square. So to demonstrate he's there, he descends into the plane. And as he descends, he first is a point, and as he gets further into it, think of a cork floating down into a water, the, the boundary between the water and the cork is like the boundary between the sphere and flatland. And all of a sudden, the square can now see that part of the sphere that is in flatland. It's a circle. It was a point, a circle, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Now he thinks a high priest has come into his house. And this, this high priest is telling, trying to tell him about the rest of his figure that extends into this cockamamie idea of the third dimension. But he still just cannot get it. So the sphere bobs up and down to show him something that can't be done in flatland. It says, if I'm talking to you here and I suddenly go from four foot two or whatever I am up to nine feet and back down to four two and up to nine feet, that's impossible. That's what the square is witnessing. And he can't explain it. But he still doesn't understand the third dimension. So the long story short is the square is eventually transformed and transferred to the spaceland. And this begins a great adventure for the square. Now he can look down and he can actually see all the shapes that could just be inferred while he was in the plane of flatland. Remember, all shapes look the same in flatland. You can't see shape. We can't see solids. We see the surface of the solid. They could only see the edge of the, of the, of the square or the circle or whatever. But now he can look and he can see the shapes that he could only infer before. He can look down and he can see his wife and his grandsons in their, in their rooms. As he gets higher, he can even see his neighbor who's in his family fast asleep. As he gets higher yet, he can see the whole of his, his town. As he gets even higher, he can see all the cities and villages and farms of flatland. He can even see into the depths of the deepest mines and caves. Nothing is hidden from his sight. Now he looks around and he sees that there are other beings in spaceland. Some of them are like him, kind of like a square, only they have a dimension and another they have another dimension, something he could have never imagined in flatland. There's the uh, Pentagon, kind of like the, uh, the, the, the pyramid, kind of like uh, triangles, and, and there's the sphere that's more glorious and, and beautiful than any of the flat circles in flatland. You know, it's kind of like we are, we have two natures. We have a physical nature, a physical body, and we're told we have a spirit. And we can't see the spirit, but someday we may. So the problem of revelation, this is what I want to come to here. How to make known to the inhabitants. This is the problem of the sphere. How to make known to the inhabitants of Flatland who were confined to a two-dimensional universe the reality of a third dimension that they could not experience in any way whatsoever. And God has a very similar problem. How to make known to mankind confined to the physical universe the reality of a spiritual realm that we cannot experience in any way whatsoever. You know, like, like the... Uh, like the sphere that could descend into the square's locked study. Christ, because he wasn't confined 
to the physical universe after his death could appear suddenly in the locked upper room. It's an interesting little story from 18-something. So, how has God resolved this problem of revelation? Well, he's, he's given us evidence basically in three, three areas that are available to us today. The creation, nature, God's inspired word, the Bible, and history, which records the visitation of God among us, recorded by numerous witnesses. So the problem for mankind is that uh, God has provided sufficient evidence to show that He exists and that He's loving. But we're like the, the creatures in Flatland. It's up to us to evaluate the evidence openly and honestly. The square was unable to do that. A closed mind can never come to a truth that it does not already possess. So, we're going to come back tomorrow and we're going to begin our tour of the cosmos. And it'll be a lot more beautiful, I can guarantee you. A lot of, a lot of nice pictures, but we're going to talk about what we found in the last 50 years of the space era. Thank you for coming tonight.